Thank you to everybody that's joining us today. Congressman Israel, we are live. Thank you very much, uh, uh, I'm my former Congressman, Congressman Israel. I want to welcome you to our program on environmental health and wild horses designed for the future. Uh, we're co-hosting this program with the Canna Foundation. I want to thank the team at Canna, uh, Amanda Kalimian and Aaron King Sweeney for their work. And uh, today we're featuring uh, an extraordinary member of Congress. Uh, I was elected the same, we were elected in the same year, 2000, the mighty class of 2000. Uh, <laughs> and she's actually my boss uh, on the Appropriations Interior uh, Subcommittee. She was the ranking member, now the chair. Of course, I'm talking about Congresswoman Betty McCollum, who I will introduce properly. We've also assembled uh, just a top-notch panel of experts, uh, Wayne Pacella, uh, Dr. Ross McPhee, and former Deputy Secretary of Interior, Michael Connor. They're going to introduce themselves in a moment. Uh, just a quick word, uh, this program is hosted by the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell University. Uh, our mission is very simple. We cultivate the next generation of public, service, uh, uh, public servants by deepening discourse and raising understanding through programs like this. We have featured Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and former White House Chief of Staff Reince Priebus. We are bipartisan, but we believe it's vitally important, particularly for that next generation of public servants to uh, build their skills uh, in, uh, in a democracy like uh, ours. Uh, future programs on September 24th, we have a book and author program with uh, Rick Perlstein on his new book, Reaganland. Uh, I hope you'll participate in that. That's Thursday, September 4th at 7. And on uh, Thursday, October 22nd at 7, in conjunction with the 92nd Street Y, a program on election 2020, what to expect. Uh, and uh, I will be taking the Democratic point of view and uh, uh, Congresswoman McCollum and, and my former colleague, David Jolly, will be taking the Republican perspective. Today, however, uh, a discussion about rewilding in the environment. Let me give you a very brief explanation of the context and then I'm going to introduce the Congresswoman. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I served with Congresswoman McCollum on the very important and powerful House Appropriations Subcommittee on Interior and Environment. Uh, and uh, she was the ranking member. And one day, a constituent of mine, I represented a district uh, on Long Island, a constituent named Manda Kalimian came to my office in Washington uh, and educated me about something I knew very little about. She said that there were 70,000 wild horses in federal government holding pens and 60,000 wild horses left on the range. And it cost the American taxpayer about $100 million uh, a year to round up those wild horses, sterilize and manage them, keep them in these holding pens. And she said, you know, Congressman, a much less expensive and more humane program would be to work with local landowners uh, and property owners to rewild those uh, horses to their native habitat. She told me that this is a widespread practice uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, it is uh, uh, environmental conservation. It reduces tax liabilities. Uh, it is uh, humane. Uh, I want to thank Mandy Kalimian, uh, the founder of the Canna Foundation, for educating me uh, on this issue. Uh, now to discuss uh, environment, uh, environmental health and wild horses, uh, I want to introduce you to the panel. Now, uh, Congresswoman McCollum is our featured speaker, but I'm going to ask each of our panelists just to spend one minute introducing themselves rather than me reading your bios. Please spend one minute each introducing yourselves uh, and talk briefly about what you've been focused on. And let's begin with uh, Wayne Pacelli. Thank you, Congressman Israel. Uh, great to be on the panel. Thanks to you for emceeing it and to the Canna Foundation for putting it on and Cornell for participating. Great to be with this group. I have been in the nonprofit uh, advocacy world my entire adult life. I've led a series of national animal protection groups since the late 1980s. And with that organization that I, I uh, was executive director of the Fund for Animals in 1988, uh, we sued the BLM um, over its mismanagement of horses and rounding them up. And I've been working on that issue ever since. Uh, this is an issue that is a difficult issue. It confounds a lot of people. It's been problematic for Republican and Democratic administrations. And uh, we hope to have humane uh, and sensible manners. And uh, the idea that we're rounding them up by the tens of thousands uh, is just not acceptable, especially under this current administration. So uh, look forward to the rest of the panel and thanks for having me on. 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. McPhee? Hello, everyone. My fellow panelists, but also all of you who are watching today, it's great to be here. I'm Senior Curator in Residence at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. I'm also a Scientific Advisor to the Canna Foundation, advising on the biological history and ecology of the horse. As a paleontologist, my longtime focus has been on, on biological extinction, where it happens, why it happens, how it happens, questions of this sort. This has given me a deep appreciation, not only for the fragility of life on this planet, but also its resiliency. And it's convinced me that in this country, in order for conservation activities to go forward, we have to go back. We have to go back to understand our past, what this country was like before we changed everything under relentless pressures to exploit and develop our land. The purpose in mind here is not to recreate bygone ecosystems. That's not going to happen. But it's instead to take from the past those lessons that we can give, that can give us a better future, which is what we're presumably all interested in. A future in which we attempt to live in some kind of harmony and balance with the other creatures on the planet and the forces that govern life on this planet. So we can expect to have many more millennia to enjoy. And as I hope to show you in my comments and discussion, the horse needs to be part of that future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McPhee and uh, former Deputy Secretary of Interior, Mr. Connor. Thank you very much, Steve, and thanks to Cornette oh, and, of course, to the Canna Foundation for putting on uh, today's event. And thank you, uh, Chair McCollum, for being here with us today. Um, as Steve noted, I, I'm formerly the Deputy Secretary of Interior, so I had a lot of uh, a, uh, experience uh, in the challenge of managing wild horses and burros on public lands. Uh, and I, I would just say right now I'm an, an attorney in private practice. I'm fortunate enough to work with the Canna Foundation. Uh, but this pressing issue um, from my tenure at Interior is one that uh, I would continue to like to be part of, of uh, coming up with a next generation set of solutions. And in 1971, when Richard Nixon signed the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act, uh, he started his signing statement with, by saying, we need the tonic of wildness. Uh, and I think we need that more than ever today, uh, given our situation. We've never achieved the goals of that 1971 act, uh, but I'm encouraged and hopeful uh, from the great work that uh, Canna is funding, science-based uh, uh, policy making, uh, to the very active work now being undertaken, particularly at the Appropriations Committee uh, in the Congress, particularly in the House of Representatives. Uh, clearly, we're looking for new direction, new strategies, and trying to do so connecting to the natural world. So I'm encouraged by the prospects. Uh, I think there's opportunity here and I'm happy to be part of this panel and the work ahead of us. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. Now to our featured speaker, uh, Congressman McCollum. Uh, as I told you, she was elected in 2000 and uh, you know, I was just elected to Congress. She actually made history. Uh, she made history as only the second Minnesota woman <laughs> elected to serve in Congress uh, since Minnesota's statehood in 1958. Uh, as I said, she serves as the chairwoman of the Interior Environmental Subcommittee uh, of Appropriations, also the vice chair of the Defense uh, Subcommittee. Uh, and I have to tell you, uh, serving with her uh, and watching her lead Congress and protecting the environment, protecting clean air and water, protecting wild lands and our natural, our natural treasures, uh, was actually a treasure. It was a treasure to watch her uh, do that work. Uh, so that you know the scope of the subcommittee uh, in fiscal year 2018, uh, under her leadership, the subcommittee appropriated $35 billion in funding for the Environmental Protection Agency, the Interior Department, the U.S. Forest Service, the National Endowments for the Arts and Humanities, the Smithsonian Institution, and other related agencies. Uh, she is uh, a leader in Congress on these issues. She has always been a friend. Uh, Congressman, I know that there's a possibility that they're going to call votes, and uh, we can't thank you enough uh, for uh, giving up uh, some, time, some of your very busy time to join us today. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Betty McCollum. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to join. I'm going to assume everybody can hear me because my lips are moving and nobody's like panicking. Take <laughs> unmute your mic. Um, as Steve pointed out, we, we served together for um, 
for 17, uh, for 16 years and uh, we, we became friends and that doesn't happen with every person you serve with. And so it's a, it's a long distance uh, friendship based on a lot of things that, that uh, we worked on together and, and things we found in our personal lives. Um, our love for certain types of foods and avoidance for others. <laughs> we both share uh, celiac disease. Um, so it's, it's good to see you, uh, Steve. And I wish all of you and your fa family and friends, because many of you are New York based, um, health and happiness as we live in a time of uh, COVID. So I look forward to um, being part of the discussion today. I have staff, so when I'm gone, we're still involved in this discussion, even if you don't, don't see me for a while. You see me looking up, I'm looking at a clock, I'm looking at how many people have and have not voted, so I can judge to make the maximum amount of this time. And I'm uh, excited to be with the Canna Foundation uh, again as a joint sponsor, as well as the other folks who have been sponsoring this. Uh, it's certainly an issue in which uh, after Steve and I got elected, we didn't think we'd be dealing with wild horses and here we are, and we're still struggling with this issue. And as um, Mr. Connor pointed out, 1971, sometimes the federal government comes up with good ideas, but it doesn't come up with the good implementation plans to make those ideas as successful as they should be. So um, my goal with, you, with working with you is to make sure that we're protecting the health of the herds and the health of the habitat, because if you don't look at the habitat, you're not looking at the health of the herd. But we also need to be good stewards with taxpayers' funds. So I'm gonna um, go into my uh, teaching mode. As, uh, I'm a, a former teacher and um, just kind of do a few sets here. So let's talk about the status. Let's do some numbers of the Wild Horse and Burrow Program. As it was pointed out almost 51 years ago, in 1971, the Bureau of Land Management was uh, given um, you know, the, the role of overseeing this. So here we are in, um, in, uh, the, you know, in the, the 200s, right? Uh, the Bureau of Land Management estimated that there were um, well, 48 animals on the Western land, and that's in management. Their budget, though, was a hard 20 million. By 2007, after implementing a pretty aggressive removal strategy, the Bureau believed it had gotten the number of wild horses and burros down to 28,000. So we went from 48 to 28,000. Now that number's significant because that's the number that's been identified by biologists and those involved, the, the, the bright population number to have on the rangeland in order for it to be sustainable. In 2020, the Bureau now says there are 90, Steve knows what's going off, can you hear the buzzers? I'm good, they're cleaning for, for, for 15 minutes. <laughs> they're erasing all COVID out of the house chamber. Um, so in 2020, the Bureau says now there's 95,000 animals on that land. So in 2007, we thought we had it down to 28. In 2020, we think there's 95,000 animals. That's 350% over the appropriate management level. So that's a crisis. That's a crisis for the animals. It's a crisis for all the other uh, plants and critters, reptiles, and everything else that inhabits that land. So now let's let's kind of talk about what I'm I'm dealing with right now. The proposed budget for the incoming year for uh, BLM on, on this area is 117 million dollars. Now, folks, that's a hundred percent increase from my first year in 2000 when Steve and I were on this committee. It's a 600% increase. So we have been slowly putting money into doing things that are right. As I mentioned, the population has tripled in 13 years on the range and the federal uh, funding has increased substantially as that population's increased. But what are we getting for our money? What is actually happening? And here are some facts. Um, the population costs have grown so much. Why? First, because there's many more animals being pulled off the range and held in outside facilities. The cost of those facilities alone are taking up the greatest share of the budget. Second, the decline in adoptions and other off-range placements has not kept pace with population growth. 
So there's been a, a decline in adoptions and a decline in off-range placements. And with the economy the way that it is now, um, we're probably going to see a continuing trend, perhaps, in those adoptions and off-range uh, placements. So that's exacerbating the number of uh, horses and burrows and corrals. Third, the Bureau, and I want, I'm going to be consistent on this, and this is something that Steve and I work, started working on when we were on the Appropriations Committee, and it's still true today. The Bureau has lacked good, really aggressive uh, fertility control program. Now, what makes fertility uh, so difficult? I recognize that it's difficult. We're not able to treat a high enough percentage of the mares to make the fertility program work. In 2012, the Bureau treated just over 1,000 mares. But over the six year period from, two, uh, from 2013 to 2018, the Bureau just averaged 466 treatments per year. It's gone down. Currently, there are roughly 47,000 uh, mares out there. So even treating 1,000 mares is not going to be uh, significant. Annual uh, reapplication is required. This is a one-year fix. The Bureau's primary fertility rate uh, vaccine is 90% is 90 effective, but only lasts one year. Can you imagine trying to round up the same mares annually? It's a very, very difficult thing to do. So what the Bureau is doing and what we've asked the Bureau to do is to work with outside researchers and veterinarians on a new vaccine. And if it's successful, they do have one out there. I'm not gonna plug a vaccine on, on, a, on, a, on this conversation. If someone else knows it and plugs it, that's fine. But if it's successful, uh, it could result in mares remaining in, infertile for up to five years. So that could be an incredible, incredible useful tool to getting populations level that the habitat can sustain it. So um, what is, uh, what we need to do to, to solve this problem is um, to get the right number of horses and burrows on the land. But I'm just going to kind of bring us back down to, to reality again about what's going on with costs. Off-range holding costs have skyrocketed and they're using up most of the increased funding. So I've been trying to redirect funding in, in other ways, but when they get when the BLM gets the funding and the infertility is not working and we don't have the adoptions and we don't have the off off range, the funds start being used up really quickly because of the number of horses. In uh, 60 7% of the appropriated funds, 67% in 2019 went to feeding and caring for horses that were in holding. In uh, 2000, there were 10,000 animals that were in off-range holdings. As of this August, there are 48,000 wild horses and burrows in off-range. So I just wanna stress this again, this is really eating into the budget. And then I wanna talk about the politics of this for a minute. 11,000 horses in corral, that's $5 a day. 37,000 in pasture, that's $2,000 a day. The average SNAP benefit for a child in this country is $4 a day. And we have to fight for the SNAP funding and it hasn't kept up with inflation and grocery costs, especially during times of COVID. Because of the rising costs that I just mentioned before with um, what BLM has faced, they've had to slow down the removals. So the number of horses coming off the range has been below the natural reproduction rates around 18%, and that's what's causing the explosion. So here's what I've been working on with you on the uh, folks on the panel, um, it's been bipartisan. Been working with uh, many of my Western colleagues, uh, Chris, Chris Stewart and Mr. Amade, both on the subcommittee have been fabulous. I've been out, staff's been out to their areas. I've been out to their areas. On the Interior Environment Appropriations Subcommittee, we've been expressing our concerns, our strong concerns to the administration. And we've maintained the prohibitions on slaughter. And we continue to press the Bureau to find humane solutions for the overpopulation. 
For two years, Congress, bipartisanly, mostly House-driven, has been asking BLM for detailed, specific, and viable plan to get this problem under control. Finally, this plan was submitted after two years to Congress in mid-May. Now, the BLM pat patrol, uh, proposed program um, has been working with groups and an outside coalition that has come together and they've set aside previous disagreements. That's been important to the BLM to feel the confidence to move forward working on this, and quite frankly, for members of Congress to join David Joyce and I on this. Um, by setting aside previous disagreements and advocating for better management, I want to thank the Humane Society, the SSPAC Federation, and several other interested parties. I want you to realize that this was no small feat for you to come together and reach consensus, but you did. And the goals have been largely adopted by the BLM, which means that there's significant stakeholders input. But as I said, goals, we need a plan. So the administration's idea is based on four major concepts. Drastically increasing the number of animals removed each year from 7,000 to 20,000 removals annually. Uh, move animals from high cost corrals to lower cost pastures. Over 10 years to move 220,000 horses to Midwest pastures, not identified. These are goals. We need a plan. And then to ramp up adoptions. And here again, those are goals. We need a plan, especially in this environment. Overall, it is a great goal. It could be a fabulous plan, but the ability of the Bureau to fully implement it remains to be seen. These are not small tasks. We all know that. And we know it won't come cheap. The Bureau's plan anticipates funding at about $900 million over the next five years, which is nearly a doubling of current projected costs of about $5 million. And where that increase is going to come as we deal with uh, debt and deficit and with the remains of COVID and the effect on our economy, um, it would mean substantial increases, not only for this program, but for the entire line of an increase for the Interior Appropriations Subcommittee. Their whole, their whole line has to go up. If it's just, we put a line in here and say, this is our goal, what do we cut? Do we cut USGS? Do we cut the research? Do we cut some of the work that we're doing into forest service? Do we cut work that we're doing into climate change that affects habitat? So we have to be advocating for a whole larger top line number together on the Interior Appropriations Subcommittee bill, if this is really going to have the impacts we want it to have. As I said, it is a good plan, but it doesn't come cheap. Secondly, BLM needs to really find these willing landholders to lease and exchange pasture for long-term holding of these animals as we work on an implement of rewilding program, which has to be part of this discussion as we uh, take these uh, horses and burrows and uh, work, to, uh, work to decrease population, but at the same time, increase their quality of life. Complicating the BLM, however, right now is, is a major comp. I, I'm so mad about how they reorganized BLM and didn't talk about us. I'm, I'm trying to be civil with my words, but let me just put it this way. BLM has lost most of its senior program management due to the ill-advised relocation and headquarters from Washington, D.C. to Grand Junction. Yes, we need to have people on the ground to implement the programs, but we know the research, the numbers to the pencils, um, setting up the programs can be done from anywhere. They can be done from your kitchen table right now during the time of COVID. But the way that this administration went about it, we lost some of the best and brightest minds to help us with this. So, um, that's, uh, that's my input. Uh, that's how I see the lay of the land, or should I say the lay of the range on this. And we all, all need to be working together. We can do this. We can solve this and we can rewild horses. But it's gonna take all of us, it's gonna take commitment, and it also needs a larger commitment to working together for a top line number 
for what we need to do in the interior subcommittee bill with what we will see happening with cuts because of COVID. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Betty, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I have to say, when I heard those bells go off indicating a vote, you know, you can take the congressman out of Congress, but you can't take Congress out of the congressman. I was going to just <laughs> launch out of my chair uh, and go to the elevators and vote, except that I'm on Long Island and there are no elevators in my house and I can't vote. <laughs> so wow. I know that you may have to vote. Are you... Uh, are, are you going to leave us in a moment? My, or? my staff is going to let me know when my group is called to vote. And okay. I'm in group number five. So they will let me know when group number four is voting. Okay, very good. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, I'm just going to ask you one question, then we're going to go to uh, former Deputy Secretary Connor. I'd love for his perspective on your comments and uh, get some interplay if you have the time. You know, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, representing a district from Long Island, there weren't many town meetings that I had where the issue of wild horses came up. A lot of wild things, but not wild horses. So how can the activists uh, on this issue, how would you advise them to have the most impact with your subcommittee, with the committee, with the administration? What should the activists really be focusing on? So two things, and that is, that is reaching, reaching out. And what's so important about the coalition that's, that, that has come together is it has not, it, it, people are speaking with, with one voice, with one idea, with one plan that, that, that is humane uh, and coming up with one number. But the reason why I brought up the SNAP number is, Steve, on the Appropriations Committee, we always have to live in the real world. The authorizers don't have to. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, we were authorizers early on in our career. And so what is not helpful is for authorizations to come up with these targeted dollar figures. And then, you know, people come into me and say, this is the law. You have to do this. Why aren't you doing it? You're an evil, bad person. You don't care about horses. But I'll get a target for my entire appropriations package. And I have, I have set the table. I have worked with the Republicans. I've worked with Senator Murkowski and, and, and Senator Udall when we've gone to conference committee. I've increased these lines. So I've created higher bases than they ever had before. But I need to start seeing some results. Um, I just can't keep going in and asking for more and more funding when I know what the pressures are going to be uh, this next legislative uh, session, I do know, and I'll, 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 you know, I think the Trump administration has tried to be engaged a little bit, but at the same time, they've been disengaged in the way that they have um, moved forward with um, doing planning and reorganization without doing their due diligence and following along consulting Congress. So it's, it's kind of created some friction with BLM. And BLM's focus has all been on oil and gas. It hasn't been on solving wild horses. It hasn't been on what we need to do with habitat for sage grouse. And all those things are interconnected. And that's what our constituents want us to do. They want us to work on habitat quality and improvement. So I think by structuring, we need to improve, improve the habitat for the horses. How do we go about doing that? And, I, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's our wish to keep slaughter totally off. off. That, that to me is not a solution. That's just, that, that's negligence. If, if people think that that's our solution, it's, it's, it's morally bankrupt to talk about that as a solution. So it's research, it's figuring out how to incentivize these programs for rewilding, it's working with, with the states, it's working with nonprofits, it's working with tribes, and it's getting people to, to the table with the BLM to say, but you also have to be delivering on, on, on your responsibilities. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, the chairwoman uh, mentioned the fact that BLM finally produced a plan, uh, but she also mentioned the, uh, the evisceration of, of the agency uh, and uh, the impact uh, of those staff mm -hmm. reductions on carrying out the plan. Can you comment on, you were there, you're a de uh, former Deputy Secretary of Interior, what needs to be done at the BLM to make sure that a plan that is regarded as uh, adequate to good uh, is implemented effectively? Sorry about that. Uh, get it off. Get it off mute now. Uh, thanks for the question. I think it's. I love the fact, uh, Chair McCollum, that you mentioned the realignment uh, of BLM because to implement an aggressive, 
program with the new direction that's being given from Congress, you need qualified, good personnel, you need the career ranks to, to be functional. Uh, and it starts with getting people managing the program that are responsive to the resources provided, to the direction given, working with leadership, and the leadership needs to be there to implement, to take that, those set of goals uh, that the Congresswoman mentioned and turn them into that well-defined action plan. Uh, and from that standpoint, it was disappointing that the BLM plan that came out, notwithstanding having a good framework and getting good goals, was not committed to by the administration at all. It starts off with a lengthy narrative about how, if you want to do this, this is what it'll cost, and we're not saying we're going to do this, uh, which is disappointing. Uh, and I think, you know, the overall framework, though, and is, is in place now, uh, given the good direction given from Capitol Hill, we need the details of the plan, and that means a commitment of resources. And I appreciate that the budget has gone from 2009, when the Obama administration came in, $50 million to run this program, to $100 million now. And it's going to take a bell curve of resources. We're going to have to invest now to implement those strategies of strategic gatherings for purposes of relocating to pastures of an aggressive uh, population control and contraception, uh, to uh, promoting adoptions, uh, all of those things are going to take big investments now so that hopefully we can get to a much more sustainable, uh, uh, from a budgetary standpoint, uh, budget levels uh, in the future. But I think the basic framework is there. We now need the details. We now need to be uh, aggressively implementing those details. I think BLM is moving forward with contraception pilot project. They're looking at strategic gatherings. I don't think they've come back and looked at the aggressive public-private partnerships needed to mm. bring in people and landowners to uh, humanely uh, relocate these uh, wild animals uh, to places where they can, you know, we can implement the idea of rewilding uh, and we can get them in habitats more appropriate. They'll be better off. Uh, the public lands where they're at will be better off. Uh, and we will have a more sustainable system overall. Very good. Now, I can't resist before I go to Wayne and then Dr. McPhee. Uh, I've got to ask, what is, what's more comfortable, having to testify in person before Congresswoman McCollum's <laughs> committee or, or doing it by Zoom? In the, <laughs> it, it, it's, <laughs> well, it's more comfortable by Zoom in this capacity because I'm no longer responsible. <laughs> Every single word I say. Uh, very good. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping for, we have uh, quite a nice audience. Uh, you will be, we're gonna open it up to questions and answers uh, from, our, from all of our participants at approximately 12.45. We have a very hard stop uh, of one. Again, Chairwoman, if, uh, if you've got to vote, you've got to scoot out to, to vote, we, we understand why, so you just do that. Wayne, uh, you have been at the forefront of advocacy and activism uh, for, for many, many years. Um, tell us what your focus has been with respect to uh, wild horse uh, population strategies. Well, it's a, it's a great opportunity to have this discussion and, and what a fantastic thing that Chairwoman McCollum has agreed to participate and laid out her thinking. You know, I think that the wild horse and burrow community, which is not monolithic, has been deeply critical of BLM for many years. And I think the notion of these roundups to achieve what the population level that wild, wild horse and burrows had in 1971 when the act was passed, which at that time was said to be the wild horse and burrows were vanishing. And for BLM to now say, we've got to have them at 28,000, I think is really the beginning of the problem. I think Chairwoman McCollum also identified the fact that if we're on this treadmill of rounding animals up and we don't have good fertility control on the range, to suppress population growth, we're going to just continue to stack up horses in the corrals and in the long-term holding facilities, and it is breaking the budget of BLM. You know, I'm also struck by the fact that BLM, which in many ways is among the least known of our federal land management agencies, and many of these lands are very arid, um, they're not good for, for cultivated agriculture, Many of these lands are west of the 20 inch rain line, which means that you have to have irrigation uh, in order to cultivate, um, cultivate uh, crops. It means that the BLM has really been focused on resource extraction. 
Uh, they've been involved in mining, uh, oil and gas development, and also ranching. And when we think about these number of horses, whether it's 80,000 or 90,000, um, we're a little skeptical of BLM's estimates on this. Well, let's take 80,000 as a number. Let's say there are 320,000 horse and burro hooves in the 11 Western states. There are 16 million plus hooves for cattle and livestock. And this industry has been demonizing horses, saying that they are trespassers, they're interlopers. They are competitors at some level for the forage, but for so many cattle, for 35 cattle and sheep for every wild horse, that is really where the degradation, degradation of riparian areas, where the erosion is occurring. You know, we're seeing great uh, climate change problems. These marginal lands are going to be even more difficult for these animals to live on. These reproduction rates that BLM says, oh, 18 to 20% a year, that is folly in light of what's happening in this environment with these animals. I think we've got to take a holistic look, and certainly the chairwoman has been just a fantastic conservationist and animal advocate on so many issues. We've got to look at the livestock grazing issues, and when it comes to wild horses, we've got to bear down with the tools we have now on fertility control, whether it's PZP or, or other uh, long distance delivery um, fertility control um, uh, tools volunteers and others can get out there. I've been on a bunch of on the range management projects doing fertility control. The volunteers are the ones who are looking at these herds, watching them. They can contracept the mares. We can decrease the reproductive levels of these, of these herds and not have 30,000 animals rounded up. I mean, William Perry Penley, the acting director of BLM, who proposed this plan was proposing 30,000 horses being rounded up and burrows a year. That is unsustainable. And Chairwoman McCollum is absolutely right that this is going to break the back of the Congress and the Interior Appropriations Subcommittee. We cannot have that level of roundups. We've got to do on the range management to keep these animals there while keeping reproduction down, but not buying into their, their concept that we've got to get to this 28,000 herd, uh, 28,000 horse and burrow level, which again was the original number when the act was passed when they were decreed to be vanishing. Thank you. Great segue to Dr. McPhee. Uh, Wayne, Dr. Wayne had uh, mentioned that um, uh, wild horses are regarded as trespassers, interlopers. Uh, I remember when I was in Congress, uh, I uh, heard repeatedly uh, that wild horses were an invasive species uh, you have a different perspective. Can you share it? I would be delighted to. And I'm so happy that we got a good grounding from the previous speakers on what the realities are, because I'm going to have to be a bit academic here. Whether a species is regarded as native or invasive really should be a scientific question. It shouldn't be a matter of prejudice or politics, or I think this and you think that. There should be some standard against which you can judge whether or not a species really belongs, where it is, or whether it doesn't. I believe that horses should be regarded as native species. I think they should be ranked there with other large mammals that we all know and appreciate, grizzly bears, mountain lions, bison, you name it. But the BLM, as a matter of policy, says the reverse. It says that horses are invasive. They're not belongers. They shouldn't be here. They should be ranked instead with things like medfly and fire ants and kudzu and God knows, uh, murder hornets. They're not part of our fauna. So let's think about this for a minute. And let's think about whether it matters, whether you're the one or the other, because it really does. A native species is one that evolved in a particular geographical or ecological setting. More than that, it's integrated with the other native species that live there so that they're all able to live together, as it were. So the predators don't outstrip the prey, and conversely. That's how ecosystems actually work. An invasive species is none of this. It came from elsewhere. Through some chain of circumstances, it managed to get into a new place. But very frequently, it is not integrated, nor even integratable with the ecosystem in which it arrived, and then harm comes along. Now, 
it also go, goes beyond that. And this is where I want to make it real. The difference in this country, as it should be, regarding native species versus invasive species, it's a very stark difference. Not a, and it has nothing to do with legislation or policy. That's not the part I'm talking about. I'm talking about attitudes, how people feel about things that have been labeled as invasive. They're outsiders. They're foreigners. They don't have citizenship in the American fauna. Now that may sound very familiar for different reasons, but it's really the same wellsprings. It's how people feel about individual species and whether or not they are belong. And when we think of bison and bald eagle and pronghorns and other unquestionably native animals, some of which we revere, our attitudes are quite different. They deserve protection, don't they? We want them to continue because they're part of us. So how did we get to this place where horses are regarded as something other, that they're on the outside? There's three basic facts that I think you should know, and we're gonna run through those very quickly. The first, as everyone knows, right? Horses first came to this continent 500 years ago with Cortes and Pizarro and that lot, the conquistadores and their successors. No, that is not true. And that's not true because of fossil evidence. We know for a fact, because there's the fossils to show it, that horses arose on this continent. They prospered here. They prospered for many, many millions of years. And during that interval, they were able to expand elsewhere through land bridges into South America and also into Eurasia over the Bering Land Bridge. And over a period of time, as recently perhaps as 6,000 years ago, some of those populations were brought into domestication, which is why we have horses today. The modern horse, the horse that we all recognize as the horse. Now, there's another fact here which puts all of this into perspective, I think. Horses disappeared from this continent 10 to 11,000 years ago and did, did so with a lot of other ice age creatures that you've heard about, like mastodons and mammoths and saber-toothed cats and, and so on. Why that happened is a matter of intense debate among academics. And that is not my concern now as to why it happened. It was instead the consequence. The consequence was that horses were gone until the Europeans brought them back 500 years ago. So the question really is, during the course of that time, did they somehow lose their citizenship in our fauna? And my argument would be no. And, how do, and why am I saying that? What's the science of that? The science comes from the genes. We now have evidence that the horses that lived in America 10,000 years ago, just before the big extinctions, were not only related to ones that were living in Eurasia at the same time, but thanks to the land bridge, there was crossing back and forth. The populations stayed in biological contact, which is the definition of a species. As long as you have biological contact and you're producing fertile, viable offspring, as we say, you are one species. So on that ground, as academic as it probably sounds to a lot of you, there is a basis for asserting the claim that horses should be regarded as native. And once they are native, that comes with rights, perhaps not a lot of rights, but it's very different from a situation in which you're regarded as just another interloper, as, as Steve was saying, a not, a, a, an organism that doesn't belong. I absolutely realize that there's management issues which have to be dealt with, and I'm all in favor of management. But let's start with putting horses in the same category as bison the same category as bald eagles, which is where they belong. Thank you very much for that uh, thorough discussion. Uh, why don't we do this? Let's open it up to questions and answers uh, from our audience uh, spread across the country. Uh, some of you uh, have already posed questions in the chat room, but I'd like Natalie to give everybody instructions uh, on how to ask a question. Natalie? Absolutely. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a raise hand function. If you click on that, it lets us know that you have a question and would like to speak with our panel. Um, as soon as I give you the go ahead, you'd be allowed to unmute yourself and then ask your question. Um, so it looks like we already have quite a few people lining up. Congressman, do you want me to take some questions? Yes, please. Great, so the first one comes from Charlotte Rowe. Charlotte, if you can unmute yourself, please.
You with us, Charlotte? Sounds like you are. Charlotte? Okay. Charlotte, you there? Yeah. We can give Charlotte another minute here. Scott Beckstead also has a question. Scott, could you please unmute your microphone and ask a question? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Where, Scott, where are you from? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Sutherland, Oregon. Great. Okay. <clears throat> so the, the BLM has uh, drafted what's called a comprehensive animal welfare plan uh, that is supposed to guide the um, uh, protocols, especially in roundups and holding, to ensure that uh, wild horses and burros are uh, treated humanely. And yet we've seen in these mass roundups that have been happening over the summer, uh, horses dying, just basically blatant uh, disregard for its own comprehensive animal welfare plan. And I'm wondering, is there any um, uh, impetus in Congress or uh, through any other route to force the BLM to abide by its own comprehensive animal welfare plan and avoid uh, all the deaths and, and the horrible images we see of, you know, foals being uh, uh, basically left behind and animals running into panels and breaking their necks. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely horrible. And I'm just wondering, is there any effort to try and get the BLM to follow its own its own policies on humane handling? Thank you. Panelists, panelists jump in. I see yeah. you raising his I, hand. Go ahead, sir. You know, I, I think what the, what the Interior Appropriations Subcommittees have done is they've basically given a bunch of money to BLM and then BLM without really specific restrictions has been allowed to execute on its wishes. And this is where the preponderance of the money is going to keeping animals in holding facilities, the 50,000 or so in holding facilities, and then to roundups, which Penley, uh, the, the acting BLM director said as many as 30,000. <laughs> no, I believe that one of the reasons that, that um, that fertility control has been such a minute part of the activities of BLM is because it's more of a roundup culture. They have a cattle culture. And you round up, you herd cattle, you gather them. They've applied that same set of, of emotional instincts and that same management framework to wild horses and burros, which is, as Ross has said, are part of the native wildlife in, in, on this continent. And the Congress has said, yes, we agree, because we passed the Wild and Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act in 1971 that said that these animals are symbols of the West and icons of America. We've, from a statutory perspective, already solved that. But is it surprising that there's inhumane treatment of the animals during these roundups when the horses are, you know, run sometimes for miles and, you know, they're put in these holding facilities? No, because that's the roundup culture that we've got to fight. And I'm just afraid that the Congress has not gotten granular enough to give BLM the guidance to use their finite resources for on the range fertility control because it's much more humane for the animals when you don't have to handle them, when you don't have to chase them. You know, the PZP vaccine is delivered with a, with a gun. So it's remote delivery. There's very little stress for the animals at all. And if you can do one or two uh, reproductive cycles without reproduction, then you've achieved something really meaningful from a fertility control perspective, and you've not inhumanely treated the animals, and you're not then creating an enormous burden by having these animals in holding facilities. All right. Uh, Michael, did you want to comment? I was just going to add something very quick, Steve. Um, sure. You know, in the legislation that's passed recently through the Appropriations Committee, they've always referenced the need for BLM to to adhere to their animal welfare plans. Uh, that's always part and parcel of the direction that's been given to the agencies. So the fact, and I'm not familiar with the footage that you mentioned, but the fact that they may not be doing that, that's typically the province of the oversight of Congress, the inspector general, or the general accounting office. And, and you know, in the past, uh, those were accountability mechanisms because there would be repercussions right. of not adhering to the direction given and adherence to the basic rule of law. Uh, we've gotten away from that in this administration. It might not uh, surprise you 
to hear me say that, uh, we need to get back to that. And those accountability mechanisms have to be real and adhered to. Thank you very much. Natalie, let's take the next question, please. Sure. So Charlotte, if you'd like to give it a try one more time, uh, you just need to unmute yourself. And if not, we're going to move over to Carla Bowers. Carla, if you could unmute yourself, please, you can ask your question. Hello, Carla, where are you calling from? Carla, uh, you were unmuted. You just muted yourself again. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, Carla, where are you calling from? I'm from California. I'm a Wild Horse and Burrow advocate. And uh, I believe so deeply in what Dr. McPhee has said about our wild horses being native. But what I see as the problem is that we need uh, like a scientific publication peer reviewed that states all that he has said and more to distribute to academia, the scientific community, the environmental community, the wildlife community, uh, to our government agencies, basically across the nation to set the record straight that our wild horses should be and are a native species to North America. And I'd like to know, if probably Dr. McPhee would answer this, is there a paper that's being written right now to this effect that we could use to get this paradigm, these lies about our wild horses changed for once and for all across the board? Doctor? Yes, Carla, there is such a paper. In fact, there's several papers being written by the scientists who've actually done the work. Those papers, as you can appreciate, have to go through a lengthy review process before they get published. That's where we are right now. We've invested, they've invested, a number of years in doing all of the work required to get the genetic information from fossils, to compare them to horses from various places in order to come up with an idea as to where American horses, Siberian horses, and so on fit within this framework. So you can expect to see it, but the millstones of academia grind very slow, and it'll be some months before they are ready to publish their results. But they're coming. Great. Thank you thank so you. much. Wayne, quick comment? Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, you know, I think it, uh, Dr. McPhee is right, right on, on, on this, but it's not just that they have claims about fitting into these ecosystems. It's the notion that they belong, which, which Ross, you, you really argued so persuasively. And I think what's happening is the critics of wild horses demonize them. They do, they try to cast them as exotics and interlopers and invaders. And this is the fundamental problem. And then when you think about the BLM layering that over with the idea, oh, well, this herd management area is going to have X number of horses. That's just how they handle their cattle. They treat these, these creatures like they, are, like they are exotic cattle that have no commercial value because they can't slaughter them. So they don't want them now because you can't monetize their value by killing them. So better than just get them out of there and reduce them to remnant populations or eliminate them entirely in herd management areas. And that's been the BLM strategy. And I think the Congress has to question this. The Congress, you know, must say, why is it 28,000? On what basis? And how do you have 4.3 million livestock on these same lands? Where's the conversation about cattle who are the contributors to climate change and who are we're killing the wolves and the mountain lions and the bears so that these largely defenseless animals on our public lands can survive? I mean, the grizzly bears are just about gone. The wolves have been reduced to remnant populations. It's because of the cattle ra ranching and the, and the sheep ranching on these same public lands that they want to cleanse of our wild horses and burros. Not entirely, but get them the remnant population so they're, they're really just in the public back. Okay, we have five minutes left. Uh, Natalie, let's take, I'm sorry, Michael, did you want to comment? I just couldn't help it. I absolutely agree with Wayne and Ross and everything they've said. I think it's really important to counteract the scapegoating that's done with around wild horses. And the acting director just several months ago talked about wild horses and burros being the, the existential threat to our public lands. Now, we've got to deal with facts and science. Herd management areas are 27 million acres out of 245 million acres that the BLM manages. I think there's bigger 
existential threats to the public lands than this small area that horses are in. Maybe climate change uh, as a starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, so absolutely, we need to get back to science, facts, and understanding the role of the horse in the ecosystem. And that's the great thing that Canada is doing with respect to uh, supporting the scientific work and trying to, to use that to come up with policy solutions. Thank you, Natalie. Let's go to the next question. I think we have time for at most two. Okay, so it looks like Charlotte is unmuted. So Charlotte, if you'd like to go ahead. Hey, thank you. Um, Charlotte, well, may I ask where you're calling from? Yeah, I'm in Colorado, and Great. I have a question because uh, it has to do with what we just talked about. Um, the AMLs, um, Congressman McCullen uh, mentioned that the um, population goal of 28,000, um, which is the total AML, uh, the BLM aims at, was approved, um, was cited by biologists as a necessary population level. But my question is, what biologists? Um, and um, this is really the core of the question because the National Academy of Sciences in its two, 2013 report on the Wild Horse and Burrow Program said that AMLs um, are arbitrary, inflexible, and need to be urgently reformed. Um, uh, according to BLM's AMLs, um, more than 75% of the herd areas would be reduced to um, what Gus Cothran has, um, has cited as um, way below the population level needed for uh, bio biological sustainability. And um, that level is 150 to 200. Char Charlotte, that, forgive, forgive yeah. me for interrupting, but, but we need you just pose the question because we have two minutes left. Yeah, the question is, um, how can those AMLs be justified? Well. Uh, as the biologist, let me say a word. If you have two ecologists in the room and you ask them the same question, what's the proper AML, you get two different answers. Now, why would that be? It's because there's a whole lot of, of uh, variables that go into the estimation. The idea that we're still relying on an AML that was propounded 50 years ago, of course, is shocking. Um, needs looking at and revision. But let me end with this, which is a much more worrisome thing. Thanks to climate change and the mega drought that the West is experiencing right now, most of those herd management areas in places like Nevada are going to be deserts in the next, in the next 20 years, even drier than they are now, less water, less forage. By leaving horses there, by requiring that these be the places where horses are kept federally, we're already ensuring that we're going to get massive reductions. All right, uh, Michael, Wayne, 30 seconds each for a wrap up, uh, and then we'll say goodbye to everybody. Uh, Michael, 30 second perspective. What do we need to know before we conclude this program? We know that we've got an emerging uh, network of folks who are interested in good science. We've got a framework for a plan that's an integrated approach to how to not only better manage our public lands and wild horses, but do better by the animals themselves. And so I think constant attention and supporting these efforts is really important as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Wayne? Yeah, I mean, the BLM has just clearly shown an inability to handle this situation. It doesn't have the proper mindset to implement a law passed by Congress to protect animals. And, um, you know, I think we need good new leadership at the BLM. And uh, I really hope that, that folks on the call uh, contact their lawmakers. We have to have a surge of public communication saying that this compromise plan is no compromise. It's a, it's a ceding of authority to the BLM that just doesn't work. Folks, for more information about the Cornell Institute of Politics, just Google Cornell Institute of Politics and Global Affairs. You can have access to our full programs. Congresswoman, Chairwoman Betty McCollum was called to a vote. She did have to scoot out. We are deeply appreciative to her. Uh, of course, Wayne Pacelli, uh, Michael Connor, uh, and Ross McPhee, thank you for your leadership, your activism, and your expertise. And to the Canna Foundation, Amanda Kalimian, Aaron King Sweeney, thank you as well. 
Uh, we hope to continue this conversation in future panels. Uh, for now, we hope everybody stays uh, safe and healthy. Uh, and with that, we'll end the program. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.